This is Duke University. Welcome, everybody. My name is Matt Nash, and I'm the executive director of CASE. You're probably all familiar that CASE is the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, a research and education center here at the Fuqua School of Business. Uh, uh, really, we aim to develop uh, leaders uh, and organizations to change the world, and we're particularly interested in promoting the entrepreneurial pursuit of social impact. Tonight is really one of the highlights of our year. Uh, we have an opportunity to honor a distinguished social entrepreneur and um, through this enterprising social innovation award, we seek to identify a special type of social entrepreneur each year. We try to recognize outstanding individuals, organizations, or companies whose innovations blend methods from the worlds of business and philanthropy to create and sustain social value that has the potential for large scale impact. We have a couple of awards and criteria that we use in, in awarding this. This is our fourth annual award. Um, basically, to, we seek to identify and celebrate the traits that these entrepreneurs must possess in order to be successful in their endeavors, including creativity, commitment, resilience, and a results-focused drive to create and sustain positive social impact. And we, we, we tend to focus on raising public awareness of outstanding individuals, organizations, and companies who endeavor to achieve more effective, sustainable, and scalable impact through enterprising social innovation. In particular, we're looking to honor social entrepreneurs who blend methods from business and philanthropy, who create social value that can sustain, uh, scale, and endure, and challenge the status quo. Nominees can come from any field, though we're particularly interested in honoring those who focus in poverty, health, education, the environment, and we accept nominations from the public, and they come from outside, uh, inside, from across Duke, and so forth. It's particularly my honor tonight to introduce this year's awardee, awardee Dr. Uh, Martin Fisher, co-founder and CEO of Kickstart International. Now, let me tell you, it almost seems like any time I'm doing a, a workshop or a training session on social entrepreneurship, Kickstart is one of those classic examples that always is so effective in illustrating what social entrepreneurship is. Just this afternoon, for example, I was talking with undergraduates in the Center for Civic Engagement who were trying to get their heads around, what is this uh, social entrepreneurship? And I hadn't actually planned to bring up the Kickstart start example, but it was a perfect fit when some of the questions started flowing. Um, over the past two decades, Martin, his partner uh, Nick Moon, and the entire Kickstart team have demonstrated that by bringing together the incredible entrepreneurial spirit of the world's poorest people, innovative tools and technologies, and the power of the marketplace, it is possible to create and sustain dramatic social impact. With its mission to get millions of people out of poverty quickly, cost-effectively, and sustainably, Kickstart innovates on two different levels. On a very practical level, Kickstart designs, develops, and mass markets inexpensive tools that poor entrepreneurs buy and use to create profitable new businesses. And the design criteria that Kickstart uses, as you can imagine, are quite, uh, quite uh, rigorous. Products must be strong and durable, portable, culturally appropriate, ergonomic, and since all tools are manually powered, they have to be incredibly energy efficient. On a systems level, Kickstart has created revolutionary and truly sustainable solutions to poverty using private uh, su sector supply chains. To date, more than 128,000 new micro-enterprises have been started in East Africa using Kickstart equipment, and more than 1,300 new enterprises are started each month. These businesses generate over $109 million in new profits each year, and farmers using Kickstart's manual irrigation pumps, on average, see a tenfold increase in net farm income. This propels their families from poverty into the middle class. Thanks to the income generated by Kickstart's pumps, over 200,000 children are able to attend their schools because families can afford tuition, supplies, and uniforms. More than 15,000 homes have been built or sustainably improved by Kickstart entrepreneurs, and families have reported improvements in health of all types and education. And all told, Kickstart has helped move over 640,000 people uh, out of poverty. Now, Martin has won numerous awards over the years and earned recognition for his work, including the Time Magazine's 2003 
European Hero Award, the Schwab Foundation's 2003 Social Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and the 2005 Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship, and 2008 Engineer of the Year by Design News. Martin has multiple degrees in engineering from Cornell and Stanford, was a Fulbright Fellow, uh, and worked in Kenya for about 17 years, I believe, before uh, developing uh, what has become Kickstart. Now, when the case team four years ago decided we wanted to try and develop a word to highlight this special blend of entrepreneurs whose innovations blend some business-inspired methods, whether through adaptation of business methods or um, adaptation or to create and enhance social value, the operation of social businesses, or formation of social uh, sector uh, ventures that have cross-sector partnerships, Kickstart was precisely the type of social entrepreneurial venture that we sought to highlight. We can think of no finer example of this. And so tonight, it's our great honor to present them with a 2003 Case Award for Enterprising Social Innovation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Martin Fisher. Very good. Thank you. Martin, please join us. Thank you. Must be my age. <laughs> All right, well, uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Matt, and uh, a special thanks to all of you coming out uh, to hear this. I understand this is your last week of classes, and so I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, <clears throat> and it's actually great to see so many people excited about hearing a talk about ending poverty. Um, it's certainly very different than when I was in graduate school. And I come from one of those families where you actually need a PhD in physics just to qualify for the family. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so sure enough, back in 1984, um, I found myself uh, in a lab at Stanford getting a PhD in mechanical engineering, but I was in a physics lab, so I, I just about made it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I kind of realized that the more education I got, um, in some ways, the less I could do. I'd really kind of educated myself into a corner. Um, and I was uniquely qualified to either try to teach, but I didn't really think I had anything to teach at that point, um, or I could have gone and worked for big oil, um, exploring for oil, or I could have done military research. And being a young and idealistic kind of guy, I was like, oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I went off to Peru and uh, went trekking in the mountains uh, to sort of ponder my future. And that was the first time that I came across uh, real poverty in a developing country, and I started thinking, well, maybe there's something I could look at and see if there's any sort of connection between uh, technology and poverty, see if there's anything I could do. And I came back and decided to apply for a Fulbright Fellowship to go to Peru, and I was putting that together, and literally two days before the applications were due, they told me, uh, excuse me, but you don't speak Spanish, you're not going to Peru. <laughs> and uh, so I flipped through the Fulbright catalog and said, oh, they speak English in Kenya, don't they? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sure enough, they do. And, and I got lucky enough to get the Fulbright, and I went down to Kenya um, back then for um, 10 months. And I ended up staying about uh, 17 years. <laughs> um, and I was hoping that I would uh, lock right into what at that time had been called the appropriate technology or intermediate technology movement, where a guy called Schumacher wrote a very famous book uh, in the mid-70s called Small is Beautiful. Everybody got very excited about uh, small-scale technologies that were going to save the world. And hundreds of millions of dollars were invested over about 10 years in appropriate technology. So I thought, 1985, great, I'm going to go join this movement and just take a, a, something to the next step. But when I got to Kenya, everybody told me, no, 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 that, that never worked. Um, we, uh, that, that's come and gone. As, as so many movements go in development, about 10 years, hundreds of millions of dollars, and then people kind of decide it doesn't work and throw it all out, usually the baby with the bathwater. Um, and uh, I was like, well, what do I know? I'm an engineer, but it seems to me like you know, there might be something that engineering could do. And I found one little group at a place called ActionAid, which is similar to Save the Children. Um, and uh, of course, I forgot what my slides are, but, but here we were in Africa, <laughs> in the very, world's very, very poorest place, of course. And the statistics I'll just throw up here. Um, the 40% going to bed, hungry every night, 45% um, living on less than a dollar a day. And I just want to say that's always a very confusing statistic to me, because the truth is many of these people are living on more like 15 to 20 cents a day. And it's actually many families that are living on a dollar a day or less. Um, and of course, in Africa, most of the people are still young. Um, and many parts of Africa, 
despite some progress in the last couple of years, are still getting poorer, and we're still having more failed states, as, as we just saw this week with Sudan going back to war, um, and a uh, coup in Mali, where we work uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so things are not getting better. But getting back to um, me being there in Kenya, um, I found this little group at Action Aid, and what they were doing is they were building uh, low-cost schools. And there was this guy, Nick Moon, and Nick was a very different background to me. He was a carpenter um, who had run his own carpentry business and then gone out to Kenya as a VSO, um, a British volunteer, and had been teaching carpentry and was building low-cost primary schools uh, in Kenya with Action Aid. Um, and so I ended up working with them and ended up joining Action Aid for the next uh, six years. And I did all sorts of things. I established a very large rural water program um, because we didn't have one at the time, so we went out and put in uh, wells and pumps and uh, ferro cement tanks and dams uh, across uh, rural communities. Um, I uh, worked with youth groups and women's groups, got them set up in small businesses. I built a couple of rural workshops and we mass produced farm equipment that we gave away to farmers. And all this kind of stuff, of course, is very typical. It actually kind of sounds like it might actually be kind of useful, in fact. Um, but the truth is that when you step back and take a look at it, and I think this is where my um, science training helped, um, was that I could actually step back and even after five or six years say, OK, let me critically look at what we were doing, and discover that we really were not having any long-term sustainable impacts. So you go into a community, you put in a, a, a water point, and of course you get the community involved, and they contribute, and you set up a nice little water committee, and you install the well, and there's nice clean water coming to the community, and everybody's happy. Um, the problem is, about four years later, when the pump breaks down for the first time, and by that time that nice committee you formed hasn't been doing anything for four years, so it's no longer there, um, and nobody's going to fix that pump because um, of the tragedy of the commons. Why should I fix it if you're going to use it? And why should you fix it if I'm going to use it? And Africa is absolutely littered with these uh, communal water points, something like 100,000 of them. Uh, nonetheless, we keep putting more and more of these things in. Everyone that I put in is, is no longer there. And everyone that everybody in my area at that time put in is no longer working. Um, and uh, giving farm equipment away to four, poor farmers sounded like not a bad idea. We were giving plows and harrows and ox-drawn carts. The trouble is they didn't really appreciate it because it was given to them, um, so it wasn't necessarily what they wanted. But much worse than that, there's a guy down the road trying to produce this stuff in a private workshop and, and make some money. Um, and we put him out of business because nobody can compete with free. Um, and so that's great. As long as our funding comes in, it's all right. But four years later, our funding runs out, and we leave the community with no farm equipment. Um, women's groups and youth groups getting involved in small businesses sounds like a nice idea, but running a business as a group is really, really hard, um, especially when that group was put together in order to um, get the money from Action Aid in order to run that business. Um, and again, as long as we're holding their hands, it works, but meanwhile, there's an entrepreneur down the road who would have liked to get into the business, and as far as we were concerned, he was a, um, a, a you know, dirty capitalist. And, uh, um, <laughs> And, but he, of course, couldn't compete with this uh, subsidized business either. And then the minute we left, the groups all fell apart also. Um, but that's development for you. And that's how things are working. So we learned some lessons over that period, um, mainly about, like I say, what doesn't work, but a few things about what you does work better. Number one lesson was that individual ownership is better than community or group ownership. And if you think about it here, even running a business with two or three uh, owners is a challenge. Um, and when you start talking about more than that, it's really hard. Um, you should sell things, not give them away. As I described, it's not actually very cheap to give things away. It's certainly not fair. Um, it's not sustainable. It hurts the private sector. It uh, creates dependency. Um, of course, there are cases in relief or public health where you might want to give things away. Um, but uh, in general, um, you have to be careful about it. I, Always say I went over to Kenya as a sort of socialist, and after four or five years there, I became sort of a small C capitalist, um, and uh, it was just pragmatism. And the other thing you learn is that nothing is taken to scale. Um, there's all these little islands of success in development where there's a great little project, and people highlight it and talk about it at business schools, but but it never actually goes anything bigger. Um, and again and again, that happens. And part of the problem is you have to really ask the right questions. 
And so the question that I asked at that time is, you know, what does a poor family really need to survive and to get out of poverty? And everybody has their different ideas. Um, you know, we hear that all sorts of things are the most important thing for a poor person. Um, food and water certainly is something you need to stay alive. Um, farm inputs, if you're going to grow something you need. Um, of course, you need some clothing. Almost all the clothing is secondhand American clothing, by the way. This, this is one of the very poorest families in Kenya, probably way up north. And even they are wearing, you know, old t-shirts from the US. Um, obviously, people need a shelter of some kind. They need cooking pots. They need then some kind of education to get out of poverty. They need health care, transport, communication. And then maybe thinking about clean water and sanitation. Maybe thinking about lighting. But one thing that all of these things have in common is that everybody lives in a cash economy and all of these things cost money. And fundamentally, if you have money, you can get any and all of these things. If you don't, you never will. So if you're asking what's the number one need of a poor person anywhere in the world, it is a way to make more money. Okay. Um, and this is something that uh, I think we need to absolutely remember. Um, and there's not many people talking about it, but it, but it is the most important thing. And in fact, it's the world's most urgent problem is that about 2.5 billion people in the world need to make a lot more money. Um, and so fine, you need more money, go get a job. Well, the formal private sector in developing countries employs almost nobody. Um, it's only 7% of the labor force in Kenya, 35 in Tanzania, and even in India, it's only 10% of the labor force implied in, uh, actually employed in the formal private sector. Right? So what does everybody else do? Well, everybody else still needs to make money. Um, and they're very hardworking, they're very entrepreneurial, and uh, they're going to find a way to make money to survive. Otherwise, they won't be alive. You really can't survive for more than a few weeks without a way to make money. So anybody who grows crops, they need the money more than they need the food, they turn around and sell. Um, they all grow them at the same time with the rain-fed harvest, and they turn around and get whatever small money they can get um, by selling their crops into the crowded market at a very low margin. Um, or they go to the city and they start their little micro-businesses. Um, most of them doing petty trade, but there's also carpentry, metalwork, tailoring, food preparation, and about two or three others. There's about nine or ten uh, um, businesses that people do uh, in these micro-businesses. Very little diversity. Everybody's competing with each other. Very low margins. Um, and it's the same when they all grow the same crop at the same time and sell it. So people are making enough money to survive, right? They're just not making enough money to get out of poverty. And that's true all across the developing world. So if you look at that and say, why? What's the problem there? Right? Well, the problem is fundamentally they're all in the wrong business. And why are they in the wrong business? Because it's really difficult when you're a very poor person with very little education to come up with a new business idea. Um, and even if you do come up with a new business idea, it's really difficult to access the right tools and equipment you need to make that business viable. Equipment that's affordable to buy, affordable to use and profitable to use is simply not available. And it's certainly not available in the local marketplace. You actually discover it's not available anywhere in the world. Um, so we said, great, why don't we solve these two problems? Um, and then we know that these entrepreneurial people can do the rest. So um, Nick and I tried to do this uh, at ActionAid. And we became very unpopular for telling people at ActionAid that uh, we didn't believe that they were doing the right thing. And so we got fired from ActionAid. Um, and, uh, and so what do you do when you get fired? Well, you have to do something. Um, so we went out and started an organization at that time called Aprotech, Appropriate Technologies for Enterprise Creation. Um, we later changed the name to Kickstart because nobody quite understood that acronym. Um, and uh, it's now US 501c3. And a mission, as we've heard, take millions of families out of poverty by enabling them to make a whole lot more money. Um, and how do we do it? We develop and sell very low-cost capital equipment to very poor entrepreneurs who buy it and use it to start profitable businesses. So that's great. You start an organization. But how do you start an organization if you don't have any money yourself? And we were lucky, as we left Action Aid, we got a matching grant from DFID, the British government. Um, and they said, whatever you raise, we'll match it um, to start this organization. Well, that's nice, because zero plus zero equals zero. <laughs> and so in the beginning, we gave up our salaries and pretended we were raising our salaries. Um, it didn't work 
worked with no money for a while, so at least we could uh, get the match for our salaries, which we then used to start something small and hire a few people. Um, but a year or two later, we still had very, very little finance. Um, and then there was a big crisis in Kenya, the Somali refugee crisis. This was the first Somali refugee crisis, not the one that we hear about more recently. Um, but at that time, you had about 350,000 Somalis pouring across the border from Somalia into northern Kenya uh, because there was civil war in Somalia. And uh, northern Kenya looks something like this. It's a total desert um, with scrub, bush. And the challenge is, at a time like that, for UNHCR to come in and build a refugee camp. And when you build a refugee camp, if, a, if you ever get a chance to visit a refugee camp uh, in a place like this, absolutely take it. It's a fascinating thing to see. Um, in the middle of the desert, you have to put in housing, which is basically tents. You have to put in water, which is uh, deep, um, deep pumps and big tanks. Um, you have to bring in food, and you also have to provide a solution for sanitation. Um, and typically what people do is uh, they have communal toilets. And so maybe a few hundred people would use a communal pit latrine. Um, but the Somalis were unique. Um, in the history of UNHCR, because the Somalis were pastoralist people, and they had a good tradition. You don't go to the toilet where someone else has been to the toilet. Um, so they didn't really like these communal toilets, and the whole desert was turning into a sewer, um, and this was a big problem, and I had a good friend who happened to be the head of uh, um, water and sanitation at UNHCR, and we happened to have been playing around with a nice little technology. Um, sorry. I'll turn that off so we don't get it. Um, let's see all my Skype messages. <laughs> um, and, um, and so we'd been playing around with something, and, and this actually became a real opportunity for us. Um, we'd been developing a very low-cost dome pit latrine slab. This is a concrete slab, which is one and a half meters in diameter, has no reinforcing in it, it's just made from three quarters of bag of cement, very, very low cost. And we said, why don't we do individual family pit latrines? And we did a little trial project with 4,000 individual family pit latrines with CARE. Um, then we went on to become UNHCR inter-implementing partners. And we did 45,000 individual family pit latrines. And then we trained everybody else. We ended up doing 100,000 um, individual family pit latrines um, across all the refugee camps in northern Kenya. I think today it's still the very biggest uh, um, sanitation program ever done. Um, and. Uh, Anyway, the nice thing about it was when you work for UNHCR, you could charge cost plus about 6%. And so we could take that 6% over cost and charge it um, to, uh, against our matching rock and dip it. And so we had a little bit of money. And we could get back to getting away from technologies for relief and get back to technologies for development. And we rented this uh, workshop space in Nairobi in the slums on the outside of Nairobi. Um, and that's where we started. And we stayed for many, many years. Um, so, great, but what kind of technologies and tools can really take people out of poverty? And, as I said, they must make money because a poor person's number one need is a way to make more money. Not labor-saving and time-saving devices. So many people, even today, are promoting labor and time-saving devices. But the truth is, for a very poor person, you have a lot of time and a lot of labor and very little opportunity cost on your time and labor, and you're not going to buy a labor or time-saving device. Um, even a money-saving device. Well, you haven't got a lot of money to save. You're not going to spend much money on a money-saving device. You might spend maybe the price of a chicken on a money-saving device. And a chicken is a nice unit of uh, currency because every family in the world, however poor they are, they can always afford to buy at least one chicken a year to eat for a special treat. Um, and uh, so they might spend that kind of money on a money-saving device, like a fuel-efficient stove for charcoal or something like that. Um, but a fuel-efficient stove for wood, they're not going to buy because wood is free. They don't spend money on it. That's just saving time and labor. Um, so it must be a money-making device. It has to be affordable, you know, $20 or less, maybe up to a few hundred dollars if you can get some financing. And it has to have a very profitable business model, very quick cost recovery, um, something like three to six months. And why is that? Because poor people normally are farmers, and farm time is about three to six months. That's you put your money in the ground, that's when you get it back. So that's the right kind of time for recovery. So what kind of businesses would these be? Well, they have to serve a local market. Why? Because a poor person only knows the local market. Right? It's not going to be a, an export business right off the bat. Um, this is what they know. Now, if you get the right business, it's something you can start local and then later on selling to the city and then selling to export. 
Um, if you're lucky, you get the right kind of business, but it has to be a local market first. And that means you're selling products and services to who? To the poor, because that's who your neighbors are. And well, what kind of things do the poor buy? We just made a long list of all the things the poor buy, so here's a list of all the businesses these could be. It's not a very long list, because the poor don't buy that much, but that's all your possible businesses um, that you could uh, sell to the poor. Um, and uh, it turns out there's a, there's a huge number of them. Anyway, so we started off with uh, a machine here and a business in manufacturing low-cost building materials. Um, this is a particular machine for making building blocks out of soil and cement. High, very high compaction, a small amount of cement, very cheap block. Um, and this particular entrepreneur bought one of these machines. Um, he um, was a farmer. He ended up with four machines, 45 employees. Today he's a wealthy businessman in Nairobi. Um, and we've sold thousands of these machines and hundreds of thousands of buildings have been built using these machines across Africa. Um, then we developed a machine for making cooking oil from sunflower seed. You get high quality oil that you filter through that filter there um, on that side and you get high quality animal feed. Uh, this woman was a school teacher. She wanted to send her daughters off to university, couldn't afford it on a salary, saved up with her brother, bought the machine, um, employed two young men to operate the machine, contracted 20 farmers to grow a sunflower, and today her daughters are graduated from university. She's bought land, she's built a house. Um, she's a wealthy woman. Um, machine for baling hay. Turns out that if you live on a very small farm, as most people do, and you want to make money, one way to do that is to keep a cow, and you have to feed the cow, you want to milk it, um, and if you're going to feed the cow in the dry season, you have to buy hay because you can't grow enough hay on your little plot, and the only hay you can buy is baled hay because that's the only hay that can be transported, um, and the only people who can bale hay are very wealthy people with big machines. So it turns out this machine is extremely profitable. It's an expensive machine, it's about $800, but with 80 bales a day, um, a bale of hay in the dry season is about $1. Um, so you can see you make your money back pretty quickly. But those machines are great, but those are all a little bit complex and fairly expensive. Those machines are costing somewhere between $300 and $800. Um, and fairly complicated businesses. A lot of training, a lot of working capital. So what kind of business could your average poor family in Africa start? Well, 40% of the people in the world today and 80% of the poor in Africa are still poor rural farmers. And they have one asset, a little plot of land, they have one basic skill, farming, um, and we have to figure out what we can do with their assets and their skills um, in order to get them out of poverty. What business can they start? And if we're not talking about solving rural poverty, we're not talking about solving poverty. That's just a fact of life. And the best thing they can do is move away from rain-fed agriculture, where as I described a little bit, they all wait for the rain, they all plant the same crops at the same time, they all harvest at the same time. Of course, you can't sell to your neighbors because your neighbors already have the same crop at the same time. So then you're trying to sell into the market. There's very few Vehicles coming in to buy, um, the infrastructure for storage is not there, and you get very low prices, and actually anywhere between 20 and 50%, some of the latest estimates of the food grown in Africa is spoiled before it's eaten or sold. Um, nonetheless, people are doing that, making a little bit of money staying alive, um, but if you get away from that, and you start irrigating, because with irrigation, you can grow high value crops, fruits and vegetables, but much more importantly, you get three to four cycles per year, and most importantly, you grow them in the long dry season, the hungry season, you have them come to harvest then. The prices of fruits and vegetables goes up by a factor of 10 to 20 at that time, um, and just a huge amount of money to be made. And in Africa, only 4% of the land in sub-Saharan Africa, farmland, is irrigated, compared to 42% in Asia, so there's a huge potential, and of course, it's increasing with the climate change, you can't even depend on the rains anymore, so the need for irrigation is going up all the time. And what does irrigation do? Well, this is Eastern Kenya. These two pictures were taken literally 50 meters apart from each other, um, and you can see what happens when you irrigate. And when you irrigate, you don't worry about the market because you sell your crops right at your farm gate because everybody else is hungry at that time. Um, you don't worry about infrastructure or storage. Um, so it's a huge potential, but there was no affordable technology. Um, petrol pumps for irrigating are available, they're expensive, they're hard to maintain, and getting fuel in the rural areas is difficult. Um, solar energy is still too expensive, and there's no electricity, of course. So this is why we developed our line of the human-powered pumps. Uh, Super Money Maker Pump is our best-selling pump, uh, developed in 1999. You can see it's a little stair master machine. 
Um, you have a hose pipe that goes down from here, down into a well. It can pull water um, from as much as 30 feet deep. It pushes it out through another hose pipe on the other side. It can push it 30 feet up in the air or hundreds of meters along the ground. Um, and you can irrigate. If you work about two hours in the morning and three hours in the evening, you can irrigate two acres of land with this pump. Um, and it's very efficient irrigation because you're taking your hose pipe just like your garden hose pipe under pressure, and you can put that directly onto your plants. Um, and this pump retails at $98. The woman who bought this pump is Janet on deck, lived in Western Kenya, it still does, on two acres of land. She had six children of her own, and she had a co-wife who had another three children and a husband. Now her co-wife and husband died of HIV AIDS, it's a very common uh, story out there. So she's left with nine children. Now in that particular area, when your husband dies, you get inherited by your husband's brother. Um, and it's even worse than that, there's a pretty nasty ritual, which happens as a ritual raping that happens um, before you get inherited. Anyway, she refused to do any of that, um, and so she was disowned. And so she's left on two acres of land with nine young kids, and she had a bucket, and she had a little stream that ran through one corner, and she started irrigating a little patch of cabbages about half the size of this room, just to try to stay alive. And then one day she was in town, and she saw these funny-looking guys here selling a pump um, at a shop in the local town. And she saw, if I could buy this pump, that could really change my life. And it took her about eight months to save up the money to buy it, but she eventually did. She went home, she employed two young men, um, irrigated the full two acres, and made $3,200 profit in the first year. Huge amount of money in Africa. She's now become a woman's leader, told other women they don't have to be inherited, um, and uh, sent all the kids off to good schools, built a house for her son, um, totally changed her life. So that's nice, but that's a $100 pump. It's a little expensive. So we needed a lower cost pump. So we developed something called the Money Maker Hip Pump. <laughs> so this looks like a bicycle pump, but a bicycle pump you would operate like this with your arms, your arms would get very tired very quickly. Mine are already tired just doing this. <laughs> but, uh, but a hip pump, you can see it's pivoted down in that one corner. So you actually operate it like this, which you can actually do all day. So just making that very small ergonomic change, you've got a pump that you can operate all day. Um, and this little pump, Irrigates one and a quarter acres, again, in about five hours a day, a couple hours in the morning, a couple in the evening. It retails at $34. Felix and Lucy, a uh, couple with three kids, uh, no land, live north of Nairobi. Um, and uh, they were living on her father's plot. Her father had about one and a quarter acres, and he was a farmer, so they couldn't farm that plot, of course. So the young man goes to the city uh, looking for a job, uh, to Nairobi finally finds a job in the slums in an informal sector restaurant. It's making about a dollar a day. He has to live in the slum in a little cube um, and uh, try to survive and send home what he can to his wife and kid. Very, very typical story. Um, very tough life. Now this young man, he, he said, hey, there's got to be a better way. He saw this pump. He started saving up a few pennies a day. He saved about half the money, went home, got a loan from his family. Um, he rented six little plots of land. Um, and we visited him three months later. He just sold his first crop, um, $1,100 profit in three months. And uh, he also rented out the pump for a dollar a day to a neighbor. <laughs> um, so great, we can all tell a few stories, but it's got to be about some statistics. We talked about scale. Um, so what's the average? When you irrigate with a bucket, people are making about $110 a year on their farm. Um, when you irrigate with a pump here, they're making a net um, farm income of about $850 per year. So it's about $750 here, um, increased net income as a result. And this is a huge amount. In Tanzania, the average farmer who buys one of our pumps is living on about $650 per family per year. In Kenya, it's more than that, um, but even in Kenya, it's only about $1,700 per family per year. Um, so you increase by this much, and you have a huge, huge increment in, in what you can afford. And impacts to date, we already heard some of the numbers, so I'll go through them quickly, but it's 130,000 profitable new businesses, 70,000 acres of land under irrigation, 650,000 people who are measurably moved uh, above, the, above poverty, um, enough fruit and vegetables to feed 10 million people their fruit and vegetable needs, um, and uh, about 1,800 uh, new farm businesses being created every month with these pumps. And on a macro level, if you look at the new revenues generated, um, they're really equivalent to about 0.5% of the GDP of Kenya. 
um, and 0.25% of the GDP of Tanzania, and I just throw in there that in America, Microsoft produces about 0.5% of the GDP of America. So already having some macro uh, impacts. Um, and Apple, I guess, is about 0.8%. Um, so that's great, but how much money do we spend to have those impacts? What's the bang for the buck? Because we're still using donor funds, as I'll explain to you, and, and what we do with it. So for every dollar donated, we get $12 in new profits and wages earned in the first four years. Now, people actually go on earning it much longer than that um, and uh, of, the, of the operation. So that's a 12 to 1 bang for the buck. So what do we do? We design these pumps. We have a long list of design criteria. You've heard them before. I'm not going to go through them again, but they do have to be extremely they look very, very simple, but it has a huge amount of engineering them. A farmer does not hold, does not own a screwdriver or a spanner or a hammer. So these pumps have to be able to be taken apart with your hands, put back together, um, and maintained just with two hands. Um, and they have to be extremely efficient and everything else. We then get them mass produced to high quality. We used to do that in big factories in Africa, and now we've moved the production to China. You simply can't compete um, on price in Africa, even with the shipping. But this, this is our Africa factory, but it is moved to China now. Um, and then we establish a private sector supply chain um, for the big pump. Um, we import the pump at about $68 uh, from the factory in China, um, landed, not landed cost. We act as a middleman. Sometimes we have wholesalers, sometimes we don't. Uh, we sell to local retail shops. Everybody makes a margin. So at least you have a sustainable supply chain in here that everybody's making some money in the supply chain. Um, so that is the easy part in some ways, at the end of our supply chain. Who are they? They're these uh, retailers. These are agrovet shops, we call them. They sell seeds, fertilizer, pesticides. Um, and now they also sell a pump. It's the biggest ticket item they've ever sold. Um, and these are in every town uh, and city and village where we work. Um, and there's about 430 of these across the countries we're in, which are Kenya, Tanzania, Mali, and Burkina in West Africa. But that really is the easy part. Selling a pump to a farmer is extremely difficult. And why is that? Because this is a big ticket item. It's expensive. It's something they've never seen before in their life. Um, and it's a brand new thing. It's, it's like, what is it? Why should I buy it? Um, how do I even see it? And we're selling, not to wealthy people, we're selling to the very, very poorest people in the world. These are the hardest customers to reach. These are the poorest customers, the most risk averse customers. They have to be risk averse because if they buy a pump, and it doesn't work for them, they're going to go hungry for a few months. Um, and they have no savings of credit. So this is a really tough job. And of course, in rural Africa, there's almost no marketing information um, infrastructure out there. And there's limited word of mouth. And why is there limited word of mouth? That's because if you're poor, and you live in a poor community, and you make a lot of money, you don't actually even tell your family that you made a lot of money. Because if you do, your third cousin once removed will come and demand that you pay his school fees and suck the money out of you. You certainly don't tell your neighbors, they'll do the same thing. Um, there'll be jealousy, people might even come and, and destroy your pump. We've seen, seen that, not that, it's, uh, not that it's stolen, but it's destroyed you. Um, so very little word of mouth. So we have to do a major aspirational marketing campaign. Farming is not aspirational for most uh, kids and, and most people in Africa. In fact, in school nowadays, if you are doing badly in school, your teacher says you're useless, you're going to be a farmer when you grow up, go dig in the field. Um, so we have to do a campaign. Farming is my business. You have to be proud of being a business person. Uh, we're selling a better life, money maker, family life success. We're not selling a pump. Um, good looking farmers, big piles of produce, um, and uh, make it look good. We have billboards, promotions, we use discounts, um, we use uh, radio, um, we use cell phones. Um, and uh, we have commission sales staff who are out there on a daily basis, We've got 160 of them demonstrating. Um, and we train them, and they get out onto the farms. Um, initially, we thought we could just have them demonstrate at the retail shop, and you can see every retail shop is branded. Um, and then on market days in the town or in street demos, because that's certainly easier. But then we realized that farmers maybe only come to the town you know, once or twice a year, and the women very rarely come to town. Um, and they might come to their local marketplace once every two weeks, but that's not a place usually with a retail shop. So we very quickly realized that wouldn't work. We have to get out onto the farms and do the demos there. Um, so farmer field days, we work with groups. Um, we partner with companies, NGOs, outgrowers, anybody who's out there working with farmers, we partner with them. 
Um, we do market storms, we line up five pickup trucks with music blaring and water pumping and drive through the rural area. We do pumping competitions like a game show and um, market day. People get up there and pump against each other and wind pumps. And, um, so we do all this kind of marketing. And as with all marketing, we're never quite sure what's working the best. Um, and, uh, but they are eventually, people are convinced to buy these pumps and they are buying them. But what does it look like? Well. It turns out introducing, like I said, a completely new product into a new market anywhere in the world takes a lot of time and a lot of money. This isn't only in, in Africa selling to poor farmers, this is true anywhere. So let's take a look at what that looks like. If we plot here um, the sales in red and the cost per sale in blue, um, what you see is right off the bat, um, the very early adopters can really fool you. When you do your first market test, oh, we sold some of these things in the first day. Well, that's the guy sitting around with some extra cash in his pickup truck. Um, so you can really be fooled by the early market tests. You can see the sales take off very slowly, but you have to build up all the infrastructure I've just told you about. Your cost per sale is going up drastically. Your sales are still not increasing much. Eventually, your economies of scale are kicking in as you get better at it. And it's only at some critical mass there, word of mouth takes off, your cost per sale drops dramatically, competition will kick in, and there you've got uh, your typical s -curve. And at the end, you've created a whole new industry um, as uh, the competition kicks in and is selling pumps. Um, and uh, this is true, like I said, anywhere in the world for any product. It took 45 years for us to adopt motor vehicles. Um, it took 15 years for us to adopt personal computers. It took about 12 years for us to adopt uh, cell phones. And we're the wealthiest people in the world. Um, and they weren't expensive compared to these, what we're doing in Africa. So there's a fundamental market failure, and private companies simply don't design brand new big ticket items for poor rural farmers in Africa. It does not happen. And it's only profitable at scale. At scale, it can be profitable, yes. You can sell farmers bicycles because everybody already knows about them, right? But introducing it, is way too expensive. You have to have low margins. The IP is very hard to protect. Um, you can patent it, but anyone can copy it. And it just takes too much time and money to build that market. And you lose money on every sale. And how do we know this? We know this because farmers today are using the same tools they have for the last 300 years, 400 years, a machete and a handheld hoe, all farmers in Africa. Um, and uh, so nobody has figured out how to do that. So what we do is we use donor funds to basically cross that valley there um, to overcome that market failure as a smart subsidy, time-bound subsidy, um, until we get to some kind of a tipping point in the market potential. Um, and at that point, like I say, you've created um, a sustainable business and fully sustainable profitable supply chain. And it takes time and it takes money to get there. So if you're using donor funds, well, you have to measure your impacts because they're asking donors to give us money. And so we spend a lot of time and effort in measuring our impacts. We built this into our program from day one. Um, and so for every pump that we sell, it comes with a guarantee form. So that means when the farmer buys a pump at the retail shop, they have to fill out a form. If they're illiterate, they fill it out with the help of the shopkeeper. And on that form, they put their location, nearest primary school, nearest church. They put their name. They answer a couple of questions. They get a one-year guarantee. We get a database. Um, and what we can do then is randomly select people from that database within the first month or two of when they bought a pump and go and look for them in the rural area. And it might take a whole day to hunt someone down. You're looking for Mama and Jerry um, out near the primary school. And, uh, but eventually you find her and you sit down and you do a long interview with her. They've had no impact yet from the pump because they just bought it. And they haven't, they haven't uh, even if they're planted, they certainly haven't harvested their first harvest yet. And you find out what was their previous year like, and then you come back 18 months later, and why 18 months? Because we know there's about a six month run up um, in terms of utility of the pump. But then we look at that previous year, 18 months later, and then for some people go back 36 months later. At the same time, of course, we gather market intelligence by going out there and talking to them about what they need, what they like about the pump. Um, and that's how we can be pretty confident about our numbers here, that you've heard. And our target here, $300 to take a family out of poverty. We're just a little bit above that right now, but that's for all costs, including fundraising, R&D, marketing, everything, all the donor costs. Um, so we do a lot of this internal impact monitoring, but we also have invited IFPRI, which is International Food Policy Research Institute, to come and do their own study 
Um, and in fact, we were the first nonprofit to ever pay IFRI to come and do a study. Um, they have uh, about 250 uh, development economists. Um, and they're doing a three year longitudinal study um, with 3,900 of our farmers across Kenya and Tanzania to look at not only the impacts on, uh, on wealth, but also the impacts on health. And we're looking at things like stunting in children. And we actually have seen um, antidotally that uh, you, know, you have a kid who was born before he had a pump, is that tall, and the one who was born after the pump is that tall. Um, and we're seeing a huge percentage of stunting in the families that have bought the pump, and we're just waiting to see now if that changes. Um, and also looking at the impact on women, the impact on education, and everything else. So when we talk about families out of poverty, what are we actually saying? What we're really saying is then have food security and income security. What we're really saying is they're no longer worried about where the next meal comes from. Um, they're no longer worried about basic shelter, food, and clothes, and sending their kids to primary school, and basic health care. And you've got these numbers, I think these are a little outdated, I think there are over 200,000 kids in school for the first time, or better schools, um, and another 16,000 people building new houses. People do when they have money, that's actually the first priority, is sending their kids to school. Um, but being out of poverty is more than that. Being out of poverty means you have some money left over to plan for the future. And what do people do when they plan for the future? Generally, they actually invest in other um, investments in other businesses. And so you know, I met a woman the other day, and she was widowed with two kids and lived on two acres of land. Her father-in-law said, look, I'm a poor farmer. I can't do much for you, but I'll help you to buy a pump. Um, and she was telling this story, it was about eight, nine, nine years ago that she got her pump. And she was telling us, for the first four years, I used that pump, I sent my kids to school, I bought a couple of cows, I started a dairy. After four years, I upgraded to a petrol pump, I expanded the land I have. Today, my daughter is at university in Denmark, my son is in top private school in Nairobi, and it's all paid for from this farm. And she has poultry, she has uh, cattle, she has dairy, she has everything. So this is really the first step out of poverty. What we're talking about is putting someone, a family, on a different trajectory out of poverty. And what we see is this not just from the pump, but now they actually have that extra money to invest in the future, and now they actually are starting other businesses and other things. In the long term, what I believe is we have to build an empowered middle class in Africa. Um, I sometimes describe that in terms of the cost of a vote. Um, the truth is that uh, the challenge in Africa right now is leadership, and it's not surprising, it's a very new democracy, but when you can literally buy a vote for one or two dollars, which you still can do in, in rural Africa, and it still happens, um, democracy is never going to work. But if we can increase the cost of that vote to you know, 10 or 15 dollars, uh, maybe we'll get slightly harder to uh, um, buy them. And as a result, you get slightly better government, you get slightly better policy, slightly more investment. Maybe it'll go to 20 dollars, 30 dollars. Um, and uh, of course, even in America, the cost of a vote is maybe only a few hundred dollars. So, you know, our democracy works a little better. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's really, in my mind, what, we, what we're doing here, is we're trying to build that empowered middle class. And the empowered middle class, it comes from family businesses. It, it has throughout history. It's family businesses, family farms, which have uh, driven development across Europe and across America. And that's really what we're trying to do here. So. The global potential for these irrigation pumps, it's hard to know, but somewhere around 35 to 40 million. You know, we've sold about 200,000 of them so far. So you have to ask the question, in every social enterprise at some point, should we scale up? And this usually isn't asked, but it should be asked for every social enterprise, and sometimes the answer will be no. Um, and I have a particular way of thinking about this question. I have four questions that I ask. Um, to think about this question, I don't have time to go into them here, but you can check them out on our website, realgoodnotfeelgood.org. Um, and uh, you can look at the four questions that you have to ask about any social enterprise to know if it has the potential uh, to have long-term sustainable um, impacts. Anyway, for Kickstart, we did actually pass that test. Um, and so the idea is to scale. And that's great, you know, good model, good product. But it turns out it's, it's not enough, of course. Um, you know, like I said, this is really the most challenging marketing and sales job in the world. And uh, even Coke took about between 10 and 15 years to get profitable in Africa, invested hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and you know, they're selling an addictive sticky drink, um, which is a whole lot easier than selling a big ticket item like an irrigation. 
So we actually have to be a whole lot better than Coke at marketing and sales. Now we've got a long way to go, but, uh, but that's what has to happen. And so you need a high-performing organization, and uh, as a social entrepreneur, that's probably not uh, the expertise of, of many of us. Um, so you have to bring in a management team who has experience from the private sector. Um, you have to really hire some great staff. You have to put in place all your great systems to make things happen. Um, you have to, of course, have a great fundraising team too, because you need to make that, bring that money in. Um, so we've done a lot of work over the last few years on, on developing all that. You have to partner to accelerate growth. You can't do it all by yourself. Um, so we export our pumps to all the other big NGOs uh, working across Africa. Everybody from uh, FAO and WFP use our pump, World Vision. All these people use our pumps in their programs all across Africa in some 21 countries. Um, and uh, we sell them to them from China in, by bulk. Um, sell to governments. We appoint uh, distributors. Once we get a critical mass of uh, pumps in a given country, we appoint a local distributor. So you can see the blue countries are where we have retail shops. Um, the green are where we actually have appointed distributors. Um, and uh, we then break uh, containers of pumps and sell to local NGOs and CBOs. Um, we partner with MFIs and banks. We partner with big companies. Um, and we partner with uh, donors, of course. And there's a short list of some of our donors there who support us. Um, and then you have to innovate, and you have to use technology to accelerate sales and impacts. Cell phones, of course, have got across Africa, and I can, if anybody's interested afterwards, we can take a very quick look at how that happened and why that happened, and the lessons we can learn from that. Um, but we use cell phones. Um, we uh, do hot prospecting. We have cell phone marketing. Um, we've introduced recently something called cell phone layaway. Now, layaway, as many of you might remember, was very, very big in America, or you might remember from your parents. It was very big in America in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, it completely disappeared in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, and it, it's just come back um, at Walmart this year, and at Kmart. And what is layaway? Layaway is if you want to buy a big ticket item, you go to the shop and you give them a small amount of money to basically reserve that item. When you have a bit more money, you take that money and deposit it. A bit more money, you take that money and deposit it. And it's not until you fully pay for the item that you get to take it. It's basically targeted savings. Um, and it was huge in America. Every middle class and lower middle class family in America and poor family used layaway for, for every purchase. Um, and uh, so we're doing it in Kenya using M-Pesa, money transfer, so you can open a layaway account and farmers can now do micro savings to buy a pump. We're using a farmer to farmer referral program, getting farmers to benefit now from referring their friends and relatives. It turns out not monetarily benefit because that very much changes the, the whole dynamic, but actually this is a status um, um, referral deferral uh, mechanism we're using, and that came out of some focus group work we did. We want to get into actual social networking, sort of moneymaker farmers clubs, where people now would be able to network with other owners of the, of the pumps on their cell phones. We haven't done that yet, but that's on our list of things to do. We have to continually innovate in terms of our products. We just redesigned our best-selling pump, uh, and we just took $14 off the landed cost and made it lighter and more rust resistant and more efficient. And of course, this does one thing, also increases our, um, our gross margin, which is also useful. Um, and we're just introducing a, a deep well pump, which we've designed. It's a new patented technology. It can go down 60 feet instead of the 25, 30 feet as the other pumps. Um, Self-installed is a very challenging design, it turns out, to come up with something like this at that price level. Um, nobody else has done it with those kind of uh, design criteria. Um, and we want to get into other technologies for on-farm water management, because that really is the potential. So everything from water catchment to lower cost pumps, um, water distribution technologies, uh, maybe getting to drip irrigation and other things as well. Um, so constant innovation. And with all this, if we look at our sort of three to four year plan, um, it's absolutely to continue to have new innovations of products and services in the four countries we're in. We want to prove that we can get to a tipping point, at least in one part of one of the countries we're in, and learn how best to do that. Um, and then we can accelerate that across the our programs. Um, we want to move into new countries, um, and you can see the short list there, um, and also start selling worldwide. And we want to get to the point where we're selling over 100,000 pumps a year and taking 80,000 families out of poverty every year. So just to review, what have we learned? Tackling poverty, understand that the biggest need is a way to make more money. That means we need jobs. That means we need money-making products and businesses that we're going to sell to people. 
Um, and one thing I, I like to think about here is solving poverty when 80% of the people are poor is actually pretty easy. And why is that? Because 80% of the entrepreneurs, the CEOs, the doctors, the lawyers, the engineers are poor. Right? They're just as motivated and hardworking and, and smart as any of us are. Um, they just happen to be poor, and they're not looking for a handout, they're looking for an opportunity. You know, the last 10 to 15% of solving poverty, that's a much bigger challenge. And even we haven't solved that, of course, yet. Um, but there's a huge number of entrepreneurs out there who can start these businesses. Use private sector supply chains, invest time and money, because it's going to take that. Continually innovate to develop that market and solve that last mile problem. Nobody has really figured this out. How do you really bring down the cost of getting a very poor person in the rural area to change their behavior and buy a brand new product? Um, and uh, leverage partnerships and technology, and then we can take millions out of poverty. And just to go back and visit Felix and Lucy, uh, I uh, sent uh, my finance team out to visit them the other day, just uh, because we like to send the finance team out to visit farmers, see what they're doing. And they came back and told me that they'd done a calculation and uh, they had 2,000 tomato plants, 80,000 tomatoes in the field on that day, worth $6,500, um, which they had grown for three or four months. Um, and now they employ between three and 10 people. And some of the people on the finance team were actually thinking about giving up their jobs and, and buying a pot. <laughs> 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 but anyway, that's uh, what I had to say. So thanks a lot. <laughs> Happy to take any questions. Yeah. Um, in addition to the donor fund, do you ever consider other ways, such as the leasing program, loan program, or a free trial for one month, to allow more poor people to use your products? Sorry, in addition to donor grants, have we ever thought of other ways like what? Like the loan program. A loan program. Or a free trial for one month, uh, for several months, or. Um, uh, leasing program? Uh, yeah, so, so do we, why not, why not give the farmer a loan or, or lease? Um, and so it's a good question and, uh, and it very clearly would make sense if we could because it's about a three month period and then the farmer makes a lot of money. Why can't we just give the farmer a loan to, to take out that pump? Um, and especially when we hear about the success of microfinance, we say, well, you know, everybody knows how to do this, it's very simple, um, it should, shouldn't be a problem. Now, the big challenge there is that microfinance is huge, about 100 million people now, but microfinance in Africa is an urban and peri-urban um, program. Um, in Asia, it's very often a rural program. In fact, most often a rural program. Um, so why is that? Well, the primary difference is that in Asia, a large part of Asia, you find that the farmers in the rural area will live in a village and walk to their farm every day to go farm. Um, and so what that means is when you're trying to put together a, a loan group for microfinance, you can simply go into the village door to door and it's very low cost. Customer acquisition I think now is about $25 um, for microfinance in, in, in rural India. Um, in East Africa on the other hand, in much of Africa, the farmers don't live in a village, they live on the farm and farm on the farm. So they're scattered all over the place. And so bringing them together in groups becomes a much more costly affair. And the cost of customer acquisition in the rural microfinance in East Africa is about two to three hundred dollars um, to acquire a customer, um, which is about the same as it takes us to sell a pump. Um, and so um, there's clearly a, a, a problem there because what it means is you now have to go out into the rural area and you have to now be there in order to collect that loan. Um, every farmer would love to, you know, get a loan and would promise they would pay you back and they'd want to pay you back. They're not inherently dishonest, but when it comes down to it, you know, there's always some other need for that cash and they're unlikely to pay you back. Um, so if we're going to develop a, uh, a rent to own or a lease to own uh, program, what we need is a program where we have a entrepreneurial agent who is actually out there um, on a daily basis with the farmers, or at least a weekly basis or monthly basis, to actually collect that loan um, and ensure that at the time when the harvest comes in, that they get to that money before the money disappears, because after the harvest comes in, the money can disappear within a day. Um, 
And uh, that, so far, is uh, an expensive uh, thing to, to put in place. Now, we are interested in exploring ways to do that. And there are one or two new models in Africa. There's an organization called Rent to Own in uh, Zambia, which is uh, pioneering a model where they do, amongst other products, also sell our pumps. Um, and uh, we're watching them. And there's another program in Kenya where they're also trying to do this so far. They've mainly done it with uh, cows, um, giving uh, credit for cows. Um, the thing is with the pump is it's very, very portable and uh, the thing can disappear very quickly. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's, uh, we'd like to do it, but it's a big challenge. Yeah. I was just curious, what, um, about what percent of your operating costs do you cover from the profits from product sales? Yeah, so very low. It's about 5%. We, we're about uh, $7 million a year, and we make about $350,000 uh, from uh, our margins. Um, last year it was less because the shilling, the Kenya shilling uh, went insane and went from 85 to 105 in, uh, um, and we didn't change our pricing quickly enough and we were paying dollars, so we lost a lot of money there. Um, but that's that's about what it is. So it's very small. Um, yeah. In Kenya, what is the size of, of the market? So the size of the market in Kenya is a little hard to judge, but we think it's about uh, 650 to 700,000 farmers with the shallow pump. Um, and then when you add the deep lift pump, probably another 200, uh, 250,000 farmers. And so that's not only farmers who have access to water, but also who have enough sort of entrepreneurial nows. Um, and could come up with that kind of money. And so you do a lot of bunch of discounting to come up with that number, but it's, but it's very rough. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, as more farmers, as your market penetration deepens and more farmers have the pumps, will their profits each, at what point will they start making less dramatic profits because there's more off-season produce? Yeah, so eventually they will, of course, um, and that would be a nice problem to have. Um, but as with any, any new uh, business anywhere in the world, eventually the market becomes saturated and the people who come in later make less money and, and everybody, everybody makes less money. I, I still remember when it used to be that if you were a web designer, you could make a lot of money um, and be very wealthy. And uh, now, of course, it's, uh, it's not worth anything. But So eventually we'll get to that problem. We've got a long way to go. In, in Africa, um, there's less than 4%. Um, of uh, the, the farmland is irrigated. Um, and Africa, the truth is that Africa has to feed the world in the next 50 years. Um, the predictions all say that by 2050, actually, not even 50 years from now, um, we need to double the amount of food grown in the world in order to feed the world. And it's not because the population is going to double, the population is going to go to about 9, 9.5 billion, um, so 50% increase. But it's getting wealthier, and therefore it's going to be eating more. And if you look at where you could possibly get that much agriculture happening, the only place is going to be in Africa, because we're really pushing up against the limits um, in most of the other rest of the world. Uh, certainly in America, we might squeeze another 10 or 15% productivity out of our fields, um, but we're really pushing the limits. But in Africa, you can get 20, 30-fold uh, increases um, in productivity. So already, our farmers are exporting crops mm -hmm. uh, to Europe. Right. Um, and so, and, and that's gonna that's gonna grow. So it's huge. And, and then, just is the water supply um, projected to remain? <laughs> so with climate change, it's it's difficult to know. Uh -huh. um, but there's a huge amount of water in Africa which is very very underutilized. I think they say something like uh, you know 13 percent of Africa's water is utilized. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, yes, you need efficient irrigation. I mean, right now we're doing hose pipe irrigation, which is actually surprisingly efficient. Mm -hmm. um, drip irrigation would be a little bit more efficient, potentially, mm -hmm. um, but much more expensive and complicated. Um, but people will, will get to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, and you know, with the drought, yes, the level of the water does, does go down and up uh, uh, with the rain. But we're talking about rain-fed aquifers, mm -hmm. uh, shallow rain-fed aquifers. We're not talking about deep aquifers, which are ancient aquifers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So how, how are they digging 30 foot or 60 foot wells? So um, farmers who dig wells, if it's uh, between, it's less than about 12 or 15 feet, they simply go and dig a hole in the ground um, and don't hire anybody to do it. If it's deeper than that, they hire a local well digger. And there's always in virtually every community that has shallow aquifers, there's two young men usually who are well diggers. And uh, literally, it's a one meter diameter well. One guy will be down at the bottom of the well with a very small shovel and a pick and a chisel if he's going through solid rock. 
um, and chipping away in this well down, and then he'll fill a bucket, and the guy at the top of the well with a rope will pull up the bucket and dump it. And those guys will go down even 150 feet. Um, it's kind of amazing. I had a well dug in my garden just to see how it worked, and, and they went down 43 feet, um, and half of it was through solid rock. And it took them about uh, five or six weeks. Now, the thing is, when, it, when you do that, of course, then you say, well, digging a well is going to be a, 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 an added expense, and it's true. It can be expensive to dig a well. Uh, but the nice thing about digging a well is it's built in layaway. So it might take you three or four years to dig a well. I, in fact, know some people who have taken 10 years to dig a well, the very deep ones. And it's layaway because you have a little bit of money, you have the guy dig a few feet. You get a little bit of money later, they dig a few feet later. So it's not a cash flow issue. Um, it's not that you need all the money at once, at least, uh, for digging a well. Yeah. <clears throat> So we're so far, first of all, thank you for coming out here. This is uh, pretty inspiring. Um, but we're so far removed from the situation in Africa. Um, I was wondering if you have any advice uh, for how we can get more involved uh, with these type of initiatives. Uh, even as an African, I find it really challenging. Um, even I go back for two weeks, but you know, I come back here and I get so involved with what I'm doing here that it's difficult to keep thinking about innovation in that space. So do you have any advice? <laughs> I think the only advice would be you, you have to go and, and be there. Um, you know, I was, okay, I, had a, I didn't have a business background, I had an engineering background, but it was a couple of years before I actually did anything useful in Africa at all. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, because just spending time there, trying things, getting to know people, getting to really understand the market, getting to really understand what it's about, it really does take time on the ground. Um, and, you know, obviously it's not going to take you anywhere near that long um, if, if it's home, but, but to go and spend some serious time there. And, you know, if you can hook up with an organization like Kickstarter or some of the other organizations um, and come and, you know, do an internship for, you know, a few months, um, that's a, a really good way to, to try to get involved. Um, but feet on the ground is, is, really the, is really the bottom line, I think. It's, uh, like I say, it's hard to it's hard to imagine even from here. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious. For microfinance, you see a lot of um, need for kind of business support when people are starting these these businesses, and and they're trying. You know, these entrepreneurs need more than just capital, but they need uh, further technical assistance. Do you guys find that? Once they have the pump, they can kind of run their business as it, gets, as it grows? Or do you, are there any sorts of advice or support systems you have for, uh, for them as they grow their businesses? So we don't generally. I think, I think the challenge with microfinance is microfinance primarily funds petty trade, um, or it funds the other of these 10 or so businesses that I described. Um, those are very, very competitive businesses. If you're in a very competitive business marketplace, yes, you need business advice in order to figure out how to uh, um, make that business go. And fundamentally, microfinance is financing people who are in the wrong business, which is why microfinance does not take people out of poverty. Um, and all the latest evidence shows that, all the studies show that, you know, 50% of the people don't get any better at all, 50% get worse off from microfinance, and they, sorry, 25% are worse off, and maybe 25% are slightly better off. Um, but I think the thing about our pump and, and the way we think about this is let's get the business choice right first. Where if you can grow fruits and vegetables in the dry season, okay, you might not be making a thousand dollars profit, but you're going to make a few hundred dollars profit even if you blow it. Um, just because everybody needs food and your neighbors don't have it in the dry season. Um, so with all the businesses that I've, I've worked on, it's, it's trying to look at that way. You try to make the, the business itself as, as profitable as possible. But certainly in those first businesses I described, where we're talking about the block press or the oil press, um, there's more business training that is required. And with those, we actually did provide some business training. With the pumps, what we've discovered is that there's a learning curve. And we did a program where we went out and uh, took a few hundred farmers, and we gave them some training. And it was expensive, because we don't really know what, who these farmers are. And so we had to go find them in the rural area, and that took a long time. And then once we found them, we sat them down and gave them a training right then and there, because by the time you invite them to a training, it's going to be even more expensive. Um, and then we did some follow-up and, and said, well, is this training really having an impact? And yes, it put them ahead on the learning curve, but not very far ahead. Um, and the people who didn't have the training caught up within one or two uh, planting seasons. Um, so. We don't. I, I think it probably would add some delta to the businesses if we did, but is it a good investment of, uh, of funds? It's a question in terms of selling more pumps. Yeah. 
That's what I'll put it. Take yeah. two more questions. Right. Ma, and I loved the way that you described your fallout with Action Aid. I used to work in development, and Action Aid is known for getting very involved in a lot of the political issues and all the sort of complexities of development. But I'd love to hear when these farmers' children go to university and go onward, if you if you could weigh in a little bit on how you feel about the current debate about development. Then B. Samoyo talks a lot about a focus on FDI and, and bringing large corporations into Africa and, and building it up in that, that direction. Folks like Jeffrey Sachs and William Eastley might disagree. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we need both, right? Um, we absolutely need FDI in Africa. We need investments. I mean, I'm actually, you know, maybe one of the few people, but happy that the Chinese are there. Um, I think they're going to positive, you know, overall it's going to be a net positive. They're building great infrastructure. Um, and sure, they're going to take out some of the raw materials, but they're going to create a whole lot of jobs in doing it. Um, at the same time, some of these intangible problems uh, of, of you know, the, the rural poor who are uneducated, who don't have uh, any, any first leg up, um, you're still going to need the kind of subsidies that, that we're putting in and the kind of programs that we're putting in um, in order to give them that first leg up. Um, and, you know, what's happening in Kenya right now is very interesting, is Kenya is becoming actually a high-tech hub. Um, and that's because we, they finally brought the, the cable, the uh, internet cable, um, to Kenya about only about a year or two ago. And that's just made a huge difference. And you have all these educated Kenyans who have college degrees. And, and a few years ago, if you had a college degree in Kenya, it meant nothing. You were still unemployed. Uh, but now they sort of have started a bunch of high-tech, and uh, especially on cell phone applications. Um, so, but even there, you know, Google has moved into Kenya. I think that's great, right? Um, the, the big cell phone companies have certainly brought huge, huge benefits to Africa um, and continue to do that. So, I don't know. I think, I think people tend to paint this a little bit black and white. And, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is we, we need investment, absolutely. Um, and we also still need uh, to solve those market failures and those government uh, failures. We still need aid, but it has to be smart aid. And, you know, the fact that a huge amount of the aid has been wasted is, is true. <laughs> a huge amount of it has caused more damage. I described, you know, just uh, my own little um, efforts at causing damage in Africa, right? Um, so, you know, and then you multiply that up by uh, World Bank proportions, and there's a lot of damage that's been done. Um, so we need, you know, smart aid uh, combined with uh, investment in that. Yeah. Uh, two questions. I'd love to hear your thoughts on products that might work in urban poverty? And then secondly, do you really think you can scale if uh, your product only generates 5% of your budget? Because then you're, you're really dependent on donors for everything, which is yeah. not always fun. Yeah, so urban poverty is, is more of a challenge. Um, the reason people move to the urban areas um, is because there's a lot more money floating around in the urban areas. Um, and uh, there's money there as, uh, in the in the gray um, in the gray economy, there's money there in working for the wealthy people as servants, um, as drivers. Um, there's money there in day labor at big factories. Um, and uh, if you go into the urban slums, it's a very very vibrant uh, economy is taking place. Um, now the truth is that still people are you know in, in these ten or fifteen uh, industries all doing the same thing. Um, and is there a way to, to, to help them to, to make more? So the first thing is, is there's already more money in the urban areas and people, even though they look like they're worse off because we can't imagine um, being in that situation, in fact, they have more money than the people in the rural areas. Um, it's, it is tough. And you know, some of the initial building materials, uh, technologies that we developed um, certainly have been sold uh, in the urban areas. but. It's, it's a challenge there because building is a challenge because uh, the whole land rights and you know who, who gets to build and who doesn't get to build. So, so our products have been used for you know slum renewal and things like that, but those are usually sort of donor funded uh, uh, projects. Um, and so I haven't I haven't put enough thought into it um, in terms of uh, urban um, and urban industries. But you know one idea because certainly in a place like Kenya but all over Africa, an urban slum is a dark slum. There's no electricity. Um, so there's absolutely potential there, for example, for delivering light. And uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs have uh, maybe looked at the issue around light a, a little wrongly, um, in that everybody's into selling lanterns, um, solar lanterns and other things. And, and a lantern is nice, but 
it's really a middle class person who can afford an $18 solar lantern. Um, what a poor person needs actually is light, not a lantern. And presently what they do is they spend about 15, 25 cents a day on kerosene um, and or candles. And so they need to be buying light at that sort of same rate. Um, so I think there's huge potential for people actually delivering um, charged uh, lanterns uh, to households. Um, so somebody basically pays for you know a day or two of a, of a charge on a on a lantern, and that's a, certainly something that could work very well in the in the urban slums. Um, and there's a few people talking about that model. In fact, I know there's a group uh, presenting to McKinsey today or tomorrow, I think, in, in San Francisco about this. They just won uh, some competition at Davis, some uh, business model competition. But anyway, so there, there's one place. But I think good. But the urban is 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 tougher. Yeah. Second oh, sorry about uh, why why do we continue to raise money um, from donors and is that sustainable? Um, scalable and scalable. So look, there's 350 billion dollars in philanthropy in, in America, right? Um, now, how much of it is spent well is you know minuscule. <laughs> um, and so I always say, look, it's not that we need more philanthropy. What we need is some small portion of that philanthropy to be spent better. Um, and, you know, it should be that if you can offer the best bang for the buck and you're putting it out there to philanthropists, hopefully that means that you should uh, get funding as a result. The truth is most philanthropy is not very much impact-based and most philanthropy is more sort of about feeling good. And if you read that article, real good, not feel good, that's exactly what I get to in that particular article um, at that website. And, you know, I think there's a huge push has to be out there in order to create a higher impact philanthropy and educate people about what high impact philanthropy is. And if that happens, um, and if five or ten percent of the philanthropy in this country was used well, um, I think there'd be plenty of money for models like ours. Um, and so, it's a market failure if we couldn't make the money without uh, using philanthropy. Then there wouldn't be a market failure and private business would be doing it. Um, now, I could go start another business and, and try to run a business that rolls off, you know, seven or eight million dollars of profits a year. Um, and if I thought enough, I could probably go start a business like that. But that's a pretty huge business. Um, and is that easier than raising money? No. Uh, um, <laughs> so I don't think a lot of this cross-subsidy ideas, I, I don't think really make that much sense when you talk about the kind of budgets we're talking about. Um, because rolling off that kind of that amount of profits is a huge business. And, and who's, you know, how many businesses are rolling off $10 million in profits, which is where we want to be in three years from now? Um, way in the back. Last question. Yeah, just to that point, um, it seems that a lot of your budget was spe is spent on measuring the impact itself, that the, the time costs and other costs to track down the farmers, et cetera. So, I mean, is there, has there been analysis on, you know, um, how, how important that is, if you did a shoot off business that would, didn't have to track the impact, would that make you more profitable? Or are you just trying to keep the business model the same, saying we're gonna go forward relying on donor funding? Like, is there any? Yeah, so measuring impact is about 5% of our budget in the ongoing, uh, in our ongoing cycle. Um, this particular study we're doing with IFPRI is an expensive study, it's about $1.2 million. Um, so that's a pretty big chunk of our budget over, over three years, uh, but even then not that big because um, we're about 10% you know, about over three years. Um, I'm not even that. Um, so, um, I don't know. I mean, I, the hope is that if we get this IFPRI study out there and, and get it published, um, that we don't continually have to go back and prove that these things really are having impacts. We still have to do some ongoing monitoring. And monitoring, I see, is any business should be doing monitoring. You want to go talk to your customers anyway. It's customer intelligence, right? Um, market intelligence. Um, so. Any business that doesn't talk to their customers is unlikely to be successful. And if we can incorporate that as, as, as what we're doing with our monitoring, I think it's okay. Um, yeah, so. So with that, please join me in the... Uh... I'm very happy to uh, meet anybody else. If anybody, I missed your questions. Uh, I'm happy to stay here for a while. If, if... My managers will let me. <laughs> so on behalf of the case, we'd like to present you the 2012 Case Award for the Thank you so much. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.